remain standing for the reading of God's Word from the New Testament, Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 uh, through 20. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 20. Give attention to the reading of God's holy, inspired, and infallible Word. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand firm. Stand, therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints, and also for me. The words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. So ends the reading of God's holy, inspired, and infallible word. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Father God, we come before you this morning. We ask for your grace and mercy to help us to understand your word this morning, to help us apply it rightly to our lives. Lord, help us to see the need to engage in regular daily battle for not only our own spiritual good, but for the good of your church. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. You may be seated. This week I was reminded about the spiritual war that is going on around us all the time. I was reminded how evil man can be. Not by the fighting going on in between Hamas and whoever else in and over Israel. Not by a man with a gun and mental problems in Maine. No. I was reminded by watching the devil destroy the work of the gospel. I was reminded by seeing how far a man of God can fall when the devil gets his hooks into him. I was reminded about the depths to which the human heart will sink when filled with greed and pride. I've been reminded about what happens when a man gives the devil a foothold. I was also reminded through these circumstances, but also through this passage, that the Christian needs to go to battle. Not just waiting until the fight seems the hottest, but also when we just need to be, in general, on the lookout. The Christian always needs to be alert. The Christian needs to be prepared to remain standing long before they are in danger of a fall. Remain standing is our theme today. We're going to look at this, the first few verses of this passage this morning under the headings of Stand Strong, Stand Against the Enemy, and Stand in the Evil Day. Stand Strong, Stand Against the Enemy, Stand in the Evil Day. So Paul begins this section by saying, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Be strong is a familiar refrain throughout the scripture. We just read from Joshua chapter 1, and I think we heard it three or four times 
be strong. In Deuteronomy 31, Moses is speaking to the people. In Deuteronomy 31, 6, he says, Be strong and courageous. Do not fear or be in dread of them, for it is the Lord your God who goes with you. He will not leave you or forsake you. In 1 Chronicles 28, verse 20, David is talking to Solomon, his son, and says, Be strong and courageous and do it. Do not be dismayed, for the Lord your God, even my God, is with you. He will not leave you or forsake you until all the work of the service of the house of the Lord is finished. In 2 Chronicles 32, Hezekiah is speaking to the commanders of the armies. Verses 7 through 8, he says, Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or dismayed before the king of Assyria and all the horde that is with them, for they are more for there are more with us than with him. With him is the arm of flesh, but with us is the Lord our God to help us and to fight our battles. And the people took confidence from the words of Hezekiah, king of Judah. We are bid by Paul here and throughout the rest of Scripture to be strong, or to be to be strong in the Lord and the strength of His might. Be strong and courageous. You'll notice that in every one of these circumstances where he, someone is told, or the people in general are told to be strong and courageous. It is always accompanied with, the Lord is with us. The Lord is with us. We can be strong and courageous in the midst of spiritual warfare because the Lord fights for us, the Lord is with us, and the Lord goes before us. If you want to be weak and fearful, Look at your circumstances. Look at the enemy. Look at your own strength. Get distracted by whatever, and you will certainly become faint of heart. If you want to be spiritually strong and courageous, you must keep your eyes on our Deliverer, the great God who stands with and we will find strength and courage to fight and to stand. To fight and to stand. Now Paul, of course, understands this spiritual battle mm -hmm. maybe better than most of us do. I imagine the spiritual battle that Paul was engaged in was very intense because he seems to know how to fight it he seems to know how to fight it and he tells us tells the Ephesians and by extension us to put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil now this morning, we're not going to go through the armor of God. Don't have enough time. That's next week. Next week, we're going to go through the pieces of the armor of God. This week, we're setting ourselves up for the fight and the enemy in this particular verse in the next. The devil, as we know, is a schemer. He does not give up. He is crafty. He knows where and how to hit. He wants us weak. He wants us distracted. He wants us to quit. The devil was able to take 
50 years of gospel witness and turn it into dust by turning just a few hearts. It can take generations of faithfulness and ruin it with just a little bit of doubt and a little bit of speculation. And he does it. And he does it all the time. But see, the truth of the of the matter is these are the things we notice because they're the big grand acts of Satan. But I, I, I tell you that I, I that I don't think that these came all at once. Satan is smart. Satan plants small seeds. Satan moves us away from holiness and away from spiritual battle in increments. And in small measure, by creating in us spiritual apathy, spiritual pride, whatever it is to get us to stop relying on the Lord and start relying on our own strength. But here he says that we put on the whole armor of God to be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. When we talk about standing scripturally, we're not talking about standing around. We're not just talking about the ability to be upright. We're talking about the ability to stand firm, to stand strong. It is the same type of standing that you would speak of like in, in, in the tree planted by the living waters in Psalm 1 that is deeply rooted and it is fed by the waters. That tree stands because it is rooted. But standing is not just about remaining in place, scripturally speaking. It's not just about trying not to lose ground. When we notice, or we will notice, that the majority of the armor of God is defensive, that does not mean that we are not supposed mm -hmm. to try to advance in the spiritual war. We are to be those who desire to take back ground. To actively fight and not just wait till the fight is brought to us. Charles Hodge in his commentary on Ephesians says of his spiritual armor that it includes both defensive and offensive armor of the soldier. The believer has not only to defend himself but to attack his spiritual enemies. And the latter is as necessary to his safety as the former. It will not do for him to act only in the defensive. He must endeavor to subdue as well as to resist. You know, this kind of spiritual warfare begins as simply as praying the Lord's Prayer. Lead us not to temptation. Deliver us from evil. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It begins in our prayer lives and resides largely in our prayer lives. That not only God would keep us from defeat, but that our God would bring victory. Why is it that we wait until spiritual disaster happens? But he talks about more enemies in verse 12. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the... the Cosmic powers over this present darkness against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Now, he mentions a lot of different kinds of 
spiritual beings here. And we could spend a lot of time trying to sort out who are the rulers and the authorities and the cosmic powers. And I don't know that it really will help us to understand this passage any more than to understand that he is talking about, as he says toward the end of the verse, powers over this present darkness and spiritual forces of evil. Whether we understand the rank and file of the demonic doesn't really help us to understand our need to fight. Paul is laying out this array of people, this array of spiritual beings, so that they understand the magnitude of the fight. And here he uses the phrase, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. Now, a second ago, he was just talking about armor, and you don't usually see people wrestle in that kind of hand-to-hand -hand combat in armor. So he's kind of mixing his analogy, but, but by talking about wrestling with them, he is trying to communicate to us the personal combat. The hand-to-hand, -hand, the one-on-one, -on -one, the struggle of it. That it is not an easy fight. That we will have to get personally engaged. And we will have to get personally engaged over our enemy is, as he says, over this present darkness. There was a book back in the 90s called This Present Darkness. It was about spiritual warfare. I'm not sure how good the theology of it all was, but it was a very popular book at the time coming from this passage. We, however, are not darkness. We are called out of the darkness into the light, into the kingdom of the glorious Son of God. And therefore we are called to fight against the darkness, to not dwell in the darkness, because those who fight against us would love nothing better than for us to go back into the darkness, where we can hide our sin, we can revel in our sin. And he says, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Now, this, this weekend, this in a few days coming up, we, we have a holiday here. Now, depending on who you are, you may celebrate it in different ways ways. We who are Reformed celebrate the Reformation. Martin Luther going on the offensive in the spiritual war over which the, the church had lost ground. The other, of course, is the modern version of Halloween. And I don't normally rail on about such things, but I think it's important for us to think about this one point as we think of the spiritual forces of evil in this spiritual battle. Evil in our day and age is entertainment. Evil is funny. Evil is heroic. There are lots of superheroes and cartoons and such where the heroes are demons. And we don't think about it much. But evil's not funny. Evil is not entertaining. Evil is certainly not heroic. Evil 
is evil. Which is probably the <coughs> dumbest and smartest thing I've said in a long time. But you know what I mean. Evil's evil. Evil is from the devil. <coughs> the devil is evil. The fight that goes against us is evil. It is to be fought against. We must engage in the fight. Many are spiritually lethargic and defeated because they are no longer in the fight. Many's prayers, if they pray at all, have become mundane and, and powerless. Prayers have become selfish. We act, ask for, for selfish things. We don't ask for strength or victory or spiritual courage. We don't fight for ourselves. We don't fight for others. We don't pray for the defeat of the enemy. We don't pray for the church to win back lost ground. Except for maybe when we see evil arise and try to take out a whole ministry then we fight and I'm not saying you shouldn't fight then because my prayers have changed my prayers have changed as I've started to beg the Lord God to put angels at the gates of the property to guard People for their safety to even either bring repentance or judgment upon those who have sinned and continue to sin. But where's our fight run, dear boy? No wonder Satan is winning. No wonder Satan is winning. Look at our world. Satan is winning. And Satan is winning because this church stopped fighting. Oh, the church still fights. Within itself. The church fights for all the wrong things anymore. They don't fight the spiritual battle against evil powers powers of darkness. We don't do it anymore like we should. Next verse, Paul tells the Ephesians that with this armor they will be able to stand in the evil day Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. Of course, the question we ask ourselves right away when we hear that is, well, when's the evil day? Paul doesn't say when the evil day is. You know what I think the evil day is? Any day of the week that ends in Y. Every day is the evil day. Every day we are confronted with spiritual choices. We are confronted with a spiritual war that is constantly being waged around us. And every day we are given what we need in order to fight. We are given everything we need to fight, everything we need to stand. To 
stand in the evil day, having done all to stand firm. To withstand and to stand. To withstand, to be able to take the onslaught as we will see. To be able to take the slings and the arrows and that, those things that are being fired toward us so that we, so that the devil might try to take us down. It's to stand firm. To be able to not only not lose ground, but to push forward in the evil day. Why must we fight? Why must we engage in this spiritual warfare? For one reason, you don't have a choice. By virtue of belonging to Jesus Christ, by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone, by virtue of belonging to Jesus Christ, you're in the fight. And you are either fighting, either defending, moving forward, or you're getting slaughtered. One of the two. You're either fighting or you're losing. You're either fighting. Or you're losing. The other reason is that the gospel itself is at stake. Now I know as those who were reformed, we say, well, nothing is going to thwart God's plans. So it's not like our our inaction, our, our, our not fighting, will stop God from saving those he has chosen. And you know what? In one sense, you are right. And in one sense, you are completely wrong. God uses means. God accomplishes his purposes by having his people engaged in the fight. He equips us for the fight. He tells us to go into the fight. He says, I will be with you in the fight. Because that's his plan and his purpose. For us to be engaged in this war. Because as I said, the gospel is at stake. When the church doesn't fight, the church loses. And when the church loses, the gospel itself is compromised and the gospel is not proclaimed and people are not told about the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ alone, through grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. People are not confronted with their sins. As a matter of fact, the church begins to excuse sin. They redefine sin. That's what happens when the church stops fighting. Or at least stops fighting the spiritual fight. Usually they stop fighting with the powers of darkness and start fighting amongst one another. In our own lives, the same is true. When we are not fighting the gospel fight, then the spiritual warfare, the gospel is not going to go forth from our own lives. Because we will be spiritually lethargic, spiritually defeated. We will have no strength and no courage to go forward. And we become a mark against God's glory in the church. Are you in the fight? As I said, you you're in Christ, you really don't have a choice. Then are you fighting? Are you well armed? Next week we'll talk about that more. But are you willing to go into the battle knowing that God has armed you and has protected you? 
I have one more thought about the armor itself. Often people will say, ah, most of it's defensive armor, and you've got one piece of offensive armor that's the sword. Well, let me tell you, I don't want to go into an offensive situation in a war and not be protected. Being protected allows you to be on the offense. It would be like telling a, a running back in a football game to go out there and while well, everybody else is well prepared to go out without a helmet and pads. You're on offense. You're not on defense. You don't need to be suited up. That's craziness. We're taking the fight to them. We don't need to be protected. But we need to be protected because we are taking the fight to them. Because we are taking the fight to them. So I encourage you this week. Examine your life, examine your heart, examine your willingness to take the battle to the spiritual forces that the Lord God might regain lost ground. If we want truly a revival in our culture, it will start when the church fights. Lord God, gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to hear from your word. Lord, I pray that you would have encouraged your people today, that you would strengthen us, that you would prepare us to be in the spiritual war that we are already in. Help us, Lord, to be ever before you on our knees, but also engaging from your word in the spiritual battle all around us. Thank you, Lord, that you have armed and protected us. Give us grace and strength and wisdom to go forth in the battle. I pray this in Christ. This is Pastor Howard Sloan of King of Kings Reformed Church here in Bedford, Pennsylvania. Thank you for taking the time to listen to this sermon today, and I hope it blessed you. If you would like more information about King of Kings Reformed Church, you can visit us on the web at kingofkingsreform.com or you can check us out on Facebook at King of Kings Bedford. Either way, I hope you check us out and may you find the blessing of knowing and being known by our Lord Jesus Christ.